the special birthday edition of DPP. Um, today is Feb February 5th, which by the way, although today is my Hebrew birthday, my English birthday is February 20th. So in 15 days, we can do this again and uh, have another special edition with more blessings. Why not? It's, you know, right. if, if one time is good, two times is even better. Um, so today we're going to do, we are going to explore the last two aliyot, the last two readings of Yisro or Yitro. And we got the Ten Commandments. I mean, like that's one of the biggest highlights of all, all of Torah are, of course, the Ten Commandments which, as you probably know, appear twice in Chumash, twice in Torah. It, it, the Ten Commandments appear here in our Torah portion as we read about after the Exodus and the splitting of the sea, we prepared for getting the Torah at Sinai, and this is divine revelation, and this is when it happens. And then there's another instance um, in the book of Deuteronomy as Moses is speaking to the people at the end of the 40 years of traveling in the desert, before the Jewish people enter the land without him, Moses recalls the Ten Commandments and he says, remember when we were standing by the mountain and God said, and then Moses repeats the Ten Commandments uh, as a reminder. But this, in our Torah portion, what we're going to do today is in the chronological story of the Jewish people, this is when Torah is given. Now, we could spend, I mean, we could spend multiple classes on the Ten Commandments. I'm wondering now, as I say that, have we ever done a course on the Ten Commandments, to your recollection? I don't recall doing a course on the Ten Commandments, which seems like a bit of an oversight, right? It seems like that's an obvious uh, class <laughs> material. Anyway, so the Ten Commandments we could certainly, you know, do as part of a, a long course, but, but today we're going to try to get through it and understand it and a few of the deeper concepts and tie it all together as we get ready for this wonderful Shabbat, the very special Shabbat, as, uh, as, as we receive the Torah on some level once again. So I'm going to share my screen with you. And at any point, you can certainly unmute if you have a question or comment or whatever. Um, Torah reading is being pulled up as we speak. It should appear on your screen now-ish. Okay, here we go. I'm going to read. We have two readings to get through uh, to study. And like I said, chock full of of wisdom and inspiration. Exodus chapter 19, verse 20. Here we go. The Lord descended upon Mount Sinai to the peak of the mountain. And the Lord summoned Moses to the peak of the mountain and Moses ascended. So what we have here is God descends. And this is not physically, obviously. It means spiritually, conceptually. God descends to Mount Sinai, to the top of Mount Sinai. And God calls Moses to come up to that same peak. So God comes down, so to speak, Moses comes up, and they're meeting at the top of the mountain. The Lord said to Moses, <laughs> after he calls him up, <laughs> after he called him up, oh, go down. Now that you're up, I have a message. Go back down. I, I really hope they had that tram thing. Warn the people, lest they break their formation to go near to the Lord to see, and many of them will fall. We said a few days ago that the mountain was meant to be cordoned off. There was meant to be a protective barrier, so to speak, or perimeter around the mountain. No one other than Moses was meant to ascend the mountain. So God is reminding Moses, make sure to remind the people and warn them they should not break out of their formation. They should not try to rush through the barricades and or whatever they were and try to ascend the mountain because if that would be the case, many of them will fall. In other words, it's not gonna be good. Don't get too close. Um, I think I mentioned this a few days ago, the idea of recognizing and respecting spiritual boundaries. We talked about the, the passing of Nadav and Avihu, the two sons of Aaron, uh, that take place later on in the book of Leviticus, and how, according to Kabbalah, the reason that they passed away on that day that the, the tabernacle was, was inaugurated is because they had klot nefesh. They had a, um, an inspiration. The soul was so... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was so overwhelmed. It felt with overwhelming closeness to God that it jumped out of the body. And so we don't want that to happen because we're meant to be, as long as we have a role here, we're meant to be here. So God says they shouldn't get too close. You have to create boundaries around experiences so that it's not 
overwhelming and detrimental. This is true in many different areas, including our spiritual growth. One other thing that I was thinking about, as I said that, is in Kabbalah, there's an example that's given. And I don't know that I've tried it. Maybe I have, but I'll tell you the example. It's a physical example. And maybe maybe you've seen this to be true. And maybe you can corroborate this, or maybe you, you want to try it at home. It says, if you have a large fire, like imagine a bonfire, right? Imagine like a campfire, bonfire, like a lot of fire, or maybe a fireplace, you know, in the home. You take and you take a small candle and you come close to the larger fire, it says in Kabbalah that the little fire, the little flame is going to naturally, upon getting into the proximity of the larger fire, it's going to actually jump to be contained within the larger fire. It'll actually kind of like, like um, morph, if you will, into the larger fire. I don't know that I've tried it, but I don't remember if I've tried it, but it's certainly an interesting thing. But anyway, it says that that's the same thing with the soul and God, right? When the soul gets really close, really senses God, it, it could just merge into the source and out of the body. And again, this is part of the concern over here with, uh, with this experience. Let's continue. Um, and also, verse 22, God says to Moses, and also the priests who go near to the Lord, in other words, the priests who are a little bit closer, right? They also shall prepare themselves, lest the Lord wreak destruction upon them. And although that sounds like fire and brimstone, like what does that mean? Lest the Lord wreak destruction upon them. But it means essentially lest they become harmed also by getting too close. Even the priests that are naturally more spiritually into um intuitive also must maintain some sort of barrier and separation let's continue and moses said to the lord the people cannot ascend to the mount sinai for you warned us saying set boundaries to the mountain and sanctify it right so they're not going to go up you already told us to set the boundaries but the lord said to him go descend and then you shall ascend and Aaron with you but the priests and the populace shall not break the formation to send to the lord lest he wreak destruction upon them so moses is kind of saying I don't need to deliver the message. I already told them. And God said, trust me, go tell them, go tell them. You need a reminder. Um, the, the priest, the priest, the Kohanim also need a reminder, et cetera. No one should go up the mountain lest it become dangerous. So, all right, Moses went down to the people and delivered that warning. He said that he said this to them. All right. After that little preamble, a little, uh, um, safety, it's kind of like when you're on a flight, you got a little safety um, announcement, right? Don't go too close to the mountain. Don't ascend the mountain. It could be dangerous, hazardous to your health. After that, we now have the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse number one. Here we go. This is it. This is what we've all been waiting for. This is the culmination of how many centuries? I mean, this is the culmination of... Uh, of, of the vision of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and the, the slavery in Egypt. It was all for ultimately getting out and receiving our marching orders, and of course, then going to Israel. But this is receiving the, the marching orders of, of, of our connection. This is huge right here. All right, let's go. God spoke all these words to respond. Let me explain what that means. So in the Hebrews, Vaidabra Elohim, God spoke, as called Varmela, all these things or all these words, Lamar to say or to repeat. Now, I'm going to try to share this in, in as clear a way as possible. The Torah always, well, the Torah often uses this Hebrew word Lamar, which means to say or to respond. When God, when 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 any almost any verse, when the Torah um, quotes God speaking to Moses, it says, God spoke to Moses, Lamar, saying. And the understanding of Lamar is that God told Moses, Lamar, to repeat it to the Jewish people. So God wasn't privately communicating with Moses. Well, I mean, I'm sure sometimes there was a private communication, but oftentimes God spoke to Moses, Lamar, to then repeat to the rest of the people. So the commentators ask the question, why the word Lamar here? So usually Lamar means that we're having having a conversation and I'm telling you Lamar to repeat it, to say it to the other per party who's not here. But at Sinai, all the Jews were there. Not only the Jews then, but it says that all souls, all Jewish souls that would ever be born throughout history were at Mount Sinai spiritually 
and receiving the Torah. So what is the meaning of the word Lamar? God is speaking these words, Lamar, to say, to tell. Who else are you telling? Everyone's here that needs to hear, right? Who, who is it being repeated to? I want to share with you a few different answers that I think you'll find meaningful. Number one, to share with the rest of the world, right? right? So just because the Jewish people are here and Jewish souls for all time are here doesn't mean that every person is here and all, all souls are here. So the message is, Lamar, to share these values with the world, these universal values with the world. Lamar also can mean throughout um, to, to have an impression, to have a, um, to make the statement to all of time. Although again, we I said before that all the souls of all time, Jewish souls of all time were there, but Lamar could also mean that we're meant to transport the values that are about to be given into every era, every, uh, nation, era, culture, society, these are timeless values. Okay, so what are these values? Ten commandments, let's jump in. Verse number two. Commandment number one. I am the Lord your God. That sounds familiar, right? Ten commandments. I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So God introduces himself. I am the Lord your God. And, and what's What's God's resume? It's like you meet someone at a party. Hi, I'm so-and-so. So what do you do? This is what I do, right? So God is saying, so what, what do I do? I, uh, I took you out of the land of Egypt. The commentators ask the question, why is God introducing himself as the one who took us out of the land of Egypt and not as the one who created heaven and earth, which seems to be a bigger, a bigger deal than the Exodus, right? I'm the Lord your God who created everything you see. And even you in this moment are being created anew from me. So why, why talk about put on the resume as the number one point, the Exodus, why not creation, which seems to be a bigger accomplishment, a few different answers. The question makes sense. What I just said. Yeah. The question is on, on, on why God introduced himself this way. Okay, good. So, and I'll give you a few answers. Certainly there are many more. A few answers are number one. This was the most recent, you know, uh, um, impressionable, um, impressionable experience that the, that the Jewish people had. So it makes sense, you know, it makes sense if, uh, you know, it, it, speaking about creation, that happened a while ago, it happened, you know, a few thousand years prior, but speak about the Exodus, oh, I can relate to it. So this tells us about how we communicate with others. It's not always about what to us is the most significant thing. It's also about what will make the greatest impact on them on the other party that we're communicating with. It's always important to speak the language and to understand the psyche of the person that we are communicating with, especially if we're trying to influence them. So God says, who am I? I'm the one who took you out of the land of Egypt. In other words, you can relate to me, right? You can relate to that. Heaven and earth, creation, it's a little bit too big. It's a little bit too maybe detached from our, although we're alive and we're enjoying our creation, but it's, it's, a, little bit, it's a little bit too abstract for, for many people but I'm the one who took you out of the land of Egypt that we can relate to. There's another idea here, and that is creation represents nature. God as the creator is when God creates nature. The Exodus represents the supernatural. So what is God saying? I'm the Lord your God. And what is my definition? And what's, what am I all about? Not so much about nature, but about the supernatural. And that becomes a calling for us that we shouldn't be stuck in our own natures, but we should try to break out beyond that to do something big and bold beyond what is perhaps seemingly possible. Um, relating, it kind of relates to the message that we shared Wednesday night at the class, which is about stretching your arms above your head. You're not being limited by the rational, but reaching beyond what is perhaps perceived um, logically as as possible. So God is introducing himself as the God of the Exodus, one who took out of the land of Egypt that has a bondage, the idea of the miracle. Let's continue. You shall, uh, commandment number two, you shall not have the gods of others in my presence, right? So no other gods. This is again, the idea of not um, ascribing power to any other force, any other deity. Uh, specific commandment about idols. Number four, you shall not make for yourself, I mean, verse four, you shall not make for yourself a graven image 
or any likeness which is in the heavens above, which is on the earth below, or which is in the water beneath the earth. Very important, very important. A graven image means an image that's going to be used for idolatry. So it doesn't mean that you can, for your science project, create a cloud or a planet. And it doesn't mean that you can't create a sculpture of a, of a horse. I don't know why I'm going with horse. Or of a, um, in the water beneath the earth, or of a dolphin. Yeah, not a problem. You can create an image of all these things. You can take a photograph, but you can't make a graven image. Graven means an image whose utility is about worship. Remember, recall that back in the day, maybe even not so back in the day, people would worship images of the stars, the sun, moon, and stars, right? That was the way they worshiped. They worshiped these images. So the prohibition here is not just about, is not about making an image, but making an image, making a form, a picture, an image, a painting, whatever that is going to be then worshiped. Um, you shall neither prostrate yourself before them, these graven images, nor, nor worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a zealous God, right? It's not going to end well <laughs> if you are unfaithful, who visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons upon the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. By the way, this begs the question, this raises the question, is it really that God visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons? Children are punished for the iniquity of their fathers? Let's see if we have a Rashi on this to help clarify. Let's see, let's see. No. Okay. All right. So we have to, we'll have to understand that I don't have anything, any commentary at, uh, at the ready to explain that. Typically, we say that God does not punish children on behalf of parents. Okay. But seem, seemingly, it, 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 it seems to say that there is some residual effect of negativity that can extend for a few generations. But the converse is, which is verse number six, and I perform loving kindness to thousands of generations to those who love me and to those who keep my commandments. So we have like three and four generations for those who hate me, but thousands of generations for those who love me. And this um, leads our, our, our sages to say that, um, that the power of good, as we see here, is so much stronger than the power of evil. So if evil has a bit of a ripple effect, right? Good has that much more of a ripple effect. And this is something you should know. The Rebbe spoke about very often, which is the power of good is always stronger than the power of evil. And so if we see evil doing, you know, negativity, being powerful, it's just, it, it's a wake up call to inspire us to invest more in the good, which is even stronger and can have more of a stronger effect. I hope what I'm saying makes sense. Um, but in response, let's say, in response, let's say to, like the Rebbe spoke about. Rabbi like Ari. The, uh, yeah, go ahead. So, you know, I, I do believe that, um, that, you know, God visits the inequity of the fathers upon the sons in a way. So, act, you know, our actions, all of our actions impact and influence each other. So I do think that um, when there are inequities um, committed by, let's just say, us as parents, you know, our children you know, God forbid, but they carry a lot of that baggage with them. And it takes work to overcome a lot of that baggage. And that's how I kind of have always interpreted this, um, this, this verse. Um, I hear what you're saying. In other words, it's not, it's not so much of a, you know, like a supernatural punishment. It's more of the way things work, you know, if, yeah, it's, it's in what DNA. we do has an effect. What we do has an effect. That's the reality. You know, we're influenced by our upbringing, by our parents, by the homes that we're brought up in, for better or for worse. Yeah, I, I, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, the Rebbe spoke about uh, like the the uh, atomic bomb. You know how life can be destroyed with one press of a button. So much life could be destroyed, and and you know to unleash such power. And the Rebbe would always, you know, f flip it back to a call. For positive action, like if 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 destruction can happen on such a massive scale, you know, in a single moment, we have to be inspired to likewise create that type of, you know, unleash of power for the good 
to, to change the world for good. So again, just kind of getting into the mindset of, um, of, of, of good and positivity being stronger than the negative. If the negative is powerful, how much more so is the, is the positive powerful? And we, sh we should invest in it knowing that it is indeed in incredibly powerful. Um, okay, let's continue with the next commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold blame will, will not hold blameless anyone who takes his name in vain. This becomes a prohibition against you know um, cursing God or otherwise using God's name in vain. And on a subtler level, this is why, for example, I think we spoke with this a few days ago. This is why when we refer to God, we say Hashem, which is not God's name. It just means literally the name meaning we're not going to say God's name because we don't use it, use it, use God's name casually. Some people even wouldn't say God, you know, some people won't even say God in English because God means God as opposed to Hashem, which means the name. It's not euphemistic enough for some. I do it because I, when, when teaching, I think there has to be clarity. And if I'm using too many euphemisms, I feel like it's going to get too confusing, but I know people who won't say this word. And, you know, we don't even write this word when we write. Um, I know on, online here it's it's written out. But if you see my my emails or tag or whatever it is, you know, I do G with a dash instead of the O. And the idea is because there's a certain sacredness about it. And, and it, it should fill us with a, a reference to not, you know, fully articulate it like a casual. Uh, you know, we, we write the name Joe and Bob and, and God's name. We don't we don't do that in the same way. I once got pushback, I'm trying to remember where it was. I feel like it was a course that I taught at Chabad that was also videoed and published on Chabad.org. And it was a course that I taught by us. And then it was brought, filmed and broadcast and put online, including some of the handouts. And I think in one of those handouts, when I was you know, putting the source text, I wrote God with a dash. Somebody in the comments is like, so, so disrespectful to God, putting a dash instead of the O. I'm like, well, I guess it depends how you look at it, right? I mean, you, I, I hear that, but that's uh, it's a sign of, of, of reverence to keep it a little bit like that. Um, let's see. Oh, thank you, Mark. Um, transform darkness to light. Okay, let's jump back inside. Okay, here we go. Um, next commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it. All right, one of the Ten Commandments, Shabbat. Broke the top 10, God's top 10 list. Before Letterman was God, right? So here's the top 10 list. Shabbat makes it in there. Remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it. And the verse continues to discuss a little bit more about that. Six days may you work and perform all your labor. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall perform no labor, neither you, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your beast. Look at that. Even your animals should not be working. Like if you have... Um, uh, oxen to plow your field should not be working on Shabbos, nor your stranger who is in your cities. They tell a funny, they tell a story. I think it's in the Talmud about a Jewish guy who sold his cow or something, and because he needed the money, but the cow or the ox or whatever it was wouldn't work on Shabbos. The guy who bought it wasn't Jewish, and he's like, "This is a weird animal. It's not working on Shabbos." So he's like, "I'm selling it back to you because this this thing there's something wrong with it." Anyway. So we, we don't work, nor even the animals and others, nor the stranger who's in your cities. It's meant to be a day of abstention from work. Why? Verse 11, for in six days, the Lord made the heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it. It is a day of rest for God. It's a day of rest for us. It's a day, of course, I probably don't need to elaborate on this because we've spoken in so many classes about Shabbat and the beauty of Shabbat. It's a day to unplug, recharge. I know maybe that sounds um, like a contradiction. Usually we plug in to recharge. Anyway, we unplug and recharge. Spirit. We unplug from the physical and recharge spiritually. And it's not about creating something new. It's not about what we do. It's just about who we are and, and our deeper connections. Okay, next commandment. Honor your father and your mother in order that your days be lengthened on the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So it's interesting. It says, by no other mitzvah 
sorry, by not, no, none of the other 10 commandments or nine commandments, do we find a reward alongside the commandment? We're just told like, I'm the Lord your God, don't have any other gods, no graven images, don't take God's name in vain. We're just told what not to do or what to do. But here it says, honor your father and mother, and then it gives a reward in order that your days be lengthened on the land that the Lord your God is giving you. In other words, if you honor your parents, you'll live a long life. It's interesting that with this mitzvah, it comes with a reward. A we know that, of course, every good thing brings a reward, etc. But this one, the reward is stated in the mitzvah. The question is why. I'll share with you a, 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 a cute insight that says it's not really a reward. It's kind of a warning, right? Look at this. On, I'll, I'll, let me explain. Honor your father and mother. Why? Because your days will be lengthened. In other words, you're, you will also live. Oh, honor, uh, let me explain. Honor your father and mother doesn't mean when you're a kid and your parents tell you to clean your room, clean your room. I mean, that's like part of it, but that's not really what it is. Honor your father and mother. This mitzvah, according to the way we understand it in the Talmud and everywhere, means when your parents, when our parents are older and they need our help, we're meant to be there for them just like they were there for us. The Talmud says clearly, just like parents feed their young children and bathe their young children and dress their young children and take them out when they need to go out and bring them back in when they need to, to, to come back in, so too we are meant to do the same to our parents as they age and get older and may not be able to take care of themselves. Honor your father and mother means in the same way that they looked after you, look after them. Feed them and clothe them and bathe them and take them in, out and in, et cetera. Literally take care. We, we need to take care of our parents. And of course, if we can't do it directly for whatever reason, but make sure that they are taken care of, you know, otherwise make sure that that is facilitated. So what's the point? Honor your father and mother means take care of them. Don't abandon them in their older age. And so the Torah says, why? Because, please God, your days will be lengthened. And if when your days are lengthened and you become old, you're going to want your kids to take care of you. So you have to set the model of that by taking care of your parents. Does that make sense? In other words, when the grandkids, when your kids, right, see that you've taken care of your parents, that will be normal. And they, they'll take, that will be, you know, part of the fabric of what we do as a family. And then they will take care of us as we get older. The point is, it's, um, if, if, kind of like the parable is brought in, in Jewish sources, you know, of the parent who gets old, gets older, and then ask the child if they can help help them. And they basically say, oh, I mean, again, I'm, I'm missing out some details. I'm forgetting exactly how, how the parable goes. But essentially, the kid says to the parent, I didn't see you taking care of your parents like that. Like you kind of just, you know, let them be in whatever, let them fend for themselves. So, you know, that's, Again, I'm missing out. There's a, there's a parable and kind of powerful and poignant the way it's stated. But either way, the bottom line is we honor our parents. Number one, immediately, there's the idea of a blessing for long life, but there's also kind of a promise that you will live long. And it's only in your benefit if you set the tone for how we deal with our parents. And that is the way that we will be dealt with as well. Okay, let's continue. Verse can 13. I, can I comment? One comment? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Could it also be that even if your mother and your father are gone, that you should honor them in their memory and not stray, you know, respect them by keeping on the that. path? I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that's a great, a great um, angle on it. It makes a lot of sense and it resonates. Yeah. We honor them even as we get older, even if they're gone, we honor them by giving them nachas by going in the path that they, uh, that they showed us, that they blazed for us. I love it. Um, okay, let's go the last few commandments in rapid fire. These are the thou shall nots or you shall not. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. All of these, by the way, are very interpersonal um, things, right? Don't take someone's life. Don't um, compromise someone's relationship. Don't steal from them and don't bear false witness against them, which is going to cause financial harm or otherwise, or even, even worse. 
Um, and then finally, we have the final commandment, which is always an interesting one. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does that mean, your neighbor's house? So the Torah specifies, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, and whatever belongs to your neighbor. So don't covet. This is not about taking action, right? Because if that was true, then coveting your neighbor's wife, we already have that about not committing adultery. So what does it mean not to covet? It means even without taking action, even that desire, that jealousy, that coveting is not what we are meant to do. Now, what is the antidote to coveting? How can we, because one might say it's it's really hard. I mean, like, I'm not going to do anything, but I, I mean, uh, if I feel a little jealous of somebody else that seems to have, you know, more or better stuff than I have, I mean, think about it, like his ox, his donkey, whatever. Yeah, so somebody gets a, um, it's like an ox or a donkey, like a Mustang. I don't know if a Mustang is a, is a car that people covet, but let's just say, right? Like, an, uh, so you get a nice, shiny new Mustang or whatever it is, a Tesla, and it's like, oh, wow, like, I, I would love to have that. So that's, so what's going on? That seems like, okay, that's coveting and that's no good. But how do we counteract that if it's part of like the natural, normal human reaction of, you know, just seeing someone else's stuff? So there's a beautiful meditation that our sages tell us. And that is that, especially the, the Hasidic masters tell us, that God gives us everything we need for our mission. If we don't have it, it means it's not part of our mission. So to start looking at someone else's stuff and what they have is to distract ourselves from where we need to be and what we need to do. We need to use our resources in our lives, in our context, in our specific you know, areas of, of being to do what we need to do. This is straight up a distraction to start coveting, seeing other people's stuff and getting all excited about it. It's a waste of time and a distraction. One other meditation to think about, again, these are some anti-coveting meditations. And that is, if you look at the, the verse, it's interesting. It says, it specifies, don't covet the wife, the manservant, the maidservant, the ox, the donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Which you could ask, like, if, if it's whatever belongs to your neighbor, then why even specify any of these things? Because that's, right, like, it just should say, whatever, don't covet anything. But in the Hebrew, it's interesting. It doesn't say whatever in Hebrew. It says kol, v'chol. Kol means all that belongs to your friend, all that belongs to your neighbor. Not whatever necessarily, but all. Kol means all. So what's the meditation? Here it is. If you're coveting, don't just covet the mustin. Covet everything. In other words, if you really want that person's life, are you ready to fully jump into everything, including their challenges? In other words, when we covet, we typically pick and choose what we are jealous of. Oh, I want that celebrity's fame or money or whatever it is. But meanwhile, we don't know what other stuff they're dealing with. So the Torah reminds us that the, it comes with a package. It's not just uh, a wife, a man, servant, a maid, servant, an ox, and a donkey. There's a whole package. You really want that whole package? Not so fast. Be careful what you wish for. So when we catch ourselves coveting one thing, remember, you can't isolate it. It comes in a certain context. I hope I'm expressing that fairly um, clearly, that it makes sense. I find it to be a powerful meditation. They And I'll share a story alongside that. They tell a story that, you know, everyone in a certain town, all the, all the Yidin would be fetching and complaining. So one day they said, everybody, everyone, you know, complaining about their, their challenges. They told everybody one day, everybody come in to the center of town, to the square, and bring your peckle. Peckle means like a package. Bring your burden. Bring your, your your stuff. And everyone put it down in the in the center of town. And then they said, you can pick up anyone's that you want. Like anyone's peckle you can pick up. And everyone picked up their own, their own stuff. And the message is, look, it's... Would we want to trade our life for something? Not a specific item. We want to trade our lives for someone else's life? Probably not. And that's the meditation here, right? Be grateful for what we have and who we are. Those are the 10 commandments. Let's quickly go through the seventh reading and get ourselves ready for Shabbat. Here we go. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. And all the people saw the voice 
torches and the torches, the sound of the shofar and the smoking mountain. And the people saw and trembled, so they stood from afar. They The people were overwhelmed by this experience of the Ten Commandments. They said to Moses, you speak with us, and we will hear, but let God not speak to us lest we die. This is where the people tell Moses, essentially, we don't want to do this again. We don't want to hear from God directly. It is way too overwhelming. Do us a favor, Moses. You speak with him, and then you tell us what he said, and that's going to be good enough. I told, I think I told you a few days ago that, I think I mentioned this, I don't know if I did, that part of the experience of Sane was to validate all of the future communications that Moses would have with God. That when the people heard God speaking and Moses there, but they heard it from God himself, they would realize that, okay, it's legit. And if Moses says, then you can rely on him. And here we have the people coming full circle and saying, okay, we got it, message delivered. <laughs> please be the go-between because this is too intense. According to the Talmud, with every commandment, the peoples, like I mentioned before um, about climbing the mountain, the, the souls of the people jumped out of their bodies and God had to resurrect them. That's a very intense experience. It says, the Talmud says, I'll call Dibra, Dibra, Parcha Nishmasan. Every single commandment, Parcha Nishmasan, their souls leapt. L-E-A-P-T, leapt out of their bodies and had to be, they had to be revived again. That is traumatic. I'm just picturing like, you know, those those paddle shocker things, bring them back. It's uh, It was very intense. And the people said to Moses, that's it, we got it. That's, we're good, <laughs> you take it from here. But Moses said to the people, fear not, for God has come in order to exalt you in order that his awe should be upon your faces so that you shall not sin. And those Moses said, fine, but this wasn't a mistake. This was to impress this awe upon you so that you should not come to sin. And that worked for like 39 days or so, 40 days until they sit with the golden calf. So even this impression is, uh, is not guaranteed for, um, for eternity. The people remained far off, but Moses drew near to the opaque darkness where God was. The Lord said to Moses, so shall you say to the children of Israel, you have seen that from, you have seen, Right? You, you, the people, have seen with your own eyes that from the heavens I have spoken with you. You shall not make, look, God is doubling down on this, on this um, idolatry prohibition. You shall not make images of anything that is with me. In other words, anything that is alongside me or anything that I've created, like the sun, moon, and stars. Don't make images of anything like that. Gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. Of all the Ten Commandments, God is doubling down on the, on the idolatry prohibition. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall slaughter beside it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your cattle. So no gold, no silver, just an altar of earth, and you bring the offerings straight to me for other worship. Um, wherever I allow my name to be mentioned, I will come to you and bless you. In other words, whatever locations are sanctioned for offerings, like the temple, right? That's where I will be, and that's where I will bless you. This is a uh, kind of alluding to the prohibition of just opening up our own private temples and houses of, uh, of, of ritual worship. I mean, we have obviously synagogues today, but this was for um, like um, burnt offerings, like animal offerings, etc. Let's continue. We have a few more verses, and then the Torah portion will be concluded. And when you make for me an altar of stones, you shall not build them of hewn stones. Don't cut them. They have to be all natural. Lest you wield your sword upon it and desecrate it. The idea is that a sword is a, or a metal implement is used for violence. There was not to be any metal cutting of the stones for the temple, for either the temple or the, or the, the holy temple in Jerusalem that would come much later. No, they weren't allowed to use metal sharp implements because Metal is used for war, and the, the temple of God was meant to be a place of peace. Very powerful message right there about the value of peace and avoiding avoiding um, violence. By the way, or violent um, symbols and, and, and tools and implements. Um, I, 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 I want to share something with you. I know we're up to the last verse. We're going to get there in a second, but I actually want to stop sharing it and, and be able to see everybody and share with you something very interesting that it brings that, that's brought down in, in the code of Jewish law that I wonder if everybody knows. It's 
really, it's a really cool thing. It says before we recite the blessing after a meal, after a meal, that's when you recite the blessing after a meal, right? After a meal. So you take off the knife, the knives from the table. Did you know that? Let me, let me explain. You, we have a knife, let's say Shabbat, let's say tonight, right? We're going to have a Shabbat meal. And typically, you know, we do, we do Kiddush and then we do the Hamotzi and we have a knife to cut the chal. Before we finish the meal and recite the blessing after the meal, the custom is, it's brought down in the code of Jewish law, to take the knife off the table. Because a knife is, even if it's used for a challah, it's still at its core kind of a, um, I don't want to overstate it, but somewhat of a violent implement or potentially, um, you know, uh, dangerous implement. And therefore, we, um, we take it off the table before we thank God for the food. It's all about the peace and love and whatever. Anyway, I thought I'd share that. Rabbi Ari, is that before we eat? Or after? after no, 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 you can have your knife, your knife there for the meal because you need it. But right. before you thank God for it, before you, because okay. it's kind of like our tables are like an altar, right? So our tables are like an altar. And then when we bless God, when we thank God for the food after we eat, we thank God before we eat. And then after we eat, we say that a short blessing before we eat, the hamotzi or whatever it is, the hagafen for the wine. And then we say a long, a little longer um, grace after meals, after the meal. After the meal is concluded, we actually clear the knives from the table. And then we say, the blessing after a meal. It's brought down in the code of Jewish law. I think it's a beautiful symbolism. I think it's connected to what we just read about not cutting the ten stones with a metal implement. The same idea of, of it meet, needing to be a place of peace and symbolizing that by removing all sorts of um, sharp objects. Okay, uh, let's finish the last, let's, let's finish a portion with the last verse, which is also really beautiful and um, has a lot of symbolism. Take a look at this. And you shall not ascend with steps upon my altar so that your nakedness should, shall not be exposed upon it. Let me explain, and then I'm going to give you two insights. But let me first explain what it's saying. So the altar was where they would bring the offerings in the temple. Well, the tabernacle, the, the portable sanctuary or the permanent sanctuary in Jerusalem, whatever it was, they, whichever temple it was, you know, the temporary one that Moses built that would travel with him in the desert or the permanent one that King David and Solomon built later on in Jewish history in, in, in Jerusalem, there was an altar. And an altar was where you brought the offerings. The altar was an elevated structure. And to the structure, to reach the structure, there was to get up. The Torah here says, God says, don't create steps to get up to the altar. What's how do you do it? Create a ramp, uh, a ramp. Why not steps? So the Torah says, God says, so that your nakedness shall not be exposed upon it. So you take a step. So right, your legs are kind of you know spread out a little bit, and that's it. Now, what's interesting is that the priests who would be going up to the altar, and the altar again was an elevated structure, so they had to get up there somehow. So the priests would wear a, I think it's called a tunic. Does that make sense? Tunic, like a robe type thing? Yeah, but underneath, they would be wearing pants. They weren't just, right? They, they were wearing um, pants under the tunic. So if they were just wearing a robe, then we could understand this because then you're taking like a bit of a step and, you know, whatever, right? Let the imagination understand what's going on here. But they were wearing pants anyway, so what's the So here we see the extent to which Torah encourages us to think and behave in a modest fashion. Even with pants, we're not exposed, even with pants, we're meant to walk in a, in a way that's, that's more refined as opposed to less refined. Doesn't mean that when you need to get up to the second story, the second floor of, uh, of a house, you have to build lamps always in your house. You can have a stairwell also. But it, it's, it's, it's a sensitivity. And who's the sensitivity to? It's to the stones, right? I mean, who's, I mean, think about it. Who's under there, right? The steps, it's built of stone. So who cares? It's just stone. Again, it's about a sensitivity. It's about, it's about a sensitivity. 
I also share with you one, one more insight. That's one insight. The second insight is a little bit more mystical, a little bit more, I don't know, maybe a little bit more inspirational. And that is that at, after this, this Torah portion, in which we got the Torah, we read about the Ten Commandments and Revelation at Sinai. So, you know, after these big moments, after these big moments, you know, you, you and I could get really excited and, and say, that's it, we're going to, you know, we're going to do something amazing and big and take all these leaps and steps and jumps. And the Torah says, yeah, you know what? Slow and steady, slow and steady. Create a ramp, don't create steps, right? After those moments of inspiration, we might, we might find ourselves like going too fast, right? Going too fast. And that's not good for anybody. The idea of not exposing ourselves could also mean not just literally exposing ourselves, but it could mean making ourselves vulnerable to falling because we're trying to climb too fast, too fast. Is that what I'm saying? Spiritually, spiritual growth, the best way is to do it slow and steady. So for example, if somebody comes to me and says, oh, I'm so excited. I want to start doing all of the mitzvot. I'll tell them, you know what? Let's do one. Because <laughs> it's, because you can't, you got to make it sustainable. You got to make it slow and steady wins the, I don't know, whatever, the, however that expression ends, right? Slow and steady is, is the passage. If we try to jump too high, too fast, we might end up exposing ourselves, so to speak. We might end up making ourselves a little too vulnerable. Does that make sense? Rabbi. Wins the race. There you go, Karen. Yeah. Um, so isn't that sort of like when someone came to Hillel and said he wanted to learn the Torah while he stood on one leg? So he said, what is unacceptable to you? Well, I'm, I'm getting it mixed up, but you know what I'm saying? Um, what is that? Yeah, what's hateful, what's hateful to you, don't, don't do to someone else. Exactly. And then he says, and yeah. the rest is commentary. Go and study it, right? Yes. Yes. Right. He doesn't hit over the head with everything. He doesn't give him, you know, the whole the whole thing because it would be too overwhelming. So he say, he gives him a core a core tenet, a core idea, a core value, and then he says, "There, fun." Growing. I think, yeah, ex excellent connection. And I think that on the heels of Sinai, right after the experience of Sinai, you know we could be so just inspired that we're ready to do anything. And the Torah's last message, the final verse of this week's Torah portion is, don't make stairs. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be too, too much of a leap. Create a ramp to get to that altar. You want to create a sustainable way to connect and, 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 and give to God. Make sure one step at a time, gradual ascent, we should always be ascending, obviously, but but gradual is the way that uh, that makes it sustainable. Good. I have one more comment. Yes, Joy. Back to the beginning. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I think what's unsaid is I brought you, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt to receive the Torah, and you are accepting the Torah which is really, it's like it started there. He didn't have to go back to in the beginning. Right. I like that. I like that. He said, I took you out for this moment right here. So it's kind of coming full. So to talk creation, you're saying would be a distraction because that's like, that's too, that's too whatever. That's too big or too off the point. The point is I took you out of Egypt for this moment right here. I think I love the, right? We need to be writing down these insights. But anyway, I love this idea. So, it, and, it, and it fits with also the, the idea, let me just think what, I'm, what I wanna say. It fits with the idea, um, yeah, that true freedom cannot really be realized without a sense of purpose, right? You could take someone out of Egypt but then what? What, what are they going to do? Just so they have their physical freedom, but they don't have a higher calling or they don't feel like they have a direction. So the Torah is really 
the giving of the Torah is really what gives that what gives a person the children of Israel, having been slaves for hundreds of years, gives them a calling, a direction, a place to go. It makes sense that it's full that it's full circle with that. I took you out of Egypt. That was only step one. This is step two. This is this is why this is why I did that. This is this is what freedom is really all about. It's about. It's interesting because our sages say that there's no free person except for one who is studying Torah, right? So real freedom, if we're truly free, you give a person no rules, no regulations, no boundaries, no, no nothing, right? Do whatever you want. Very soon, a person could be their, their own worst enemy, right? That freedom could be a person's own worst enemy. And oftentimes we see that play out. But when we have a structure, when we have not only a structure, but, but a higher calling, that gives freedom its, um, its, its true blessing. All right, any other questions, comments? All right. No, but we wanted to sing happy birthday. I'm, I'm ready. In you know English. me, I'm always ready for that. <laughs> now everybody has to come on board, not, not me. Uh, everybody can't, can't on be, mute. What Sandrine is saying is, cannot be a solo. No, and and Rabbi and Ari, Karen knows that. if all of us are on board, just understand um, there are those of us that have awful voices, but we are whether they sound good or not, it's with a coming from a place of good intention. Okay, I understand that. And also, there's another thing on Zoom. Everyone's connection is a uh, micro is, is a little bit so no to get it synchronized. So it's going to sound as it sounds, but it's not about that. It's about the heart. It's not about the voice. It's about the heart. It's going to right. be a cacophony. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, Kara, you start. All right. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. That means a lot. Yeah, yeah. And all of you being here means a lot. And the wishes. And again, special shout out to Ray and Sandrine. You guys are amazing. And everybody, thank you all for the good wishes and the good blessings. And may we all be blessed with everything we need. And even the things that we don't know that we need. But we do need, we should be blessed, all of our needs and all of our wants, as long as it's kosher, right? As long as it's legal, we should, be, we should have everything that we, uh, that we need and want. I mean, I wish a chap could roll straight from, you know, a wonderful Torah study session into Shabbos. The Shabbos is a Shabbos of Revelation, Ten Commandments. Oh, hey. Yeah. Look, <laughs> look at your little guy. Thank you so um, much. <laughs> pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. All right, thanks for all the good wishes, and we'll see you all. Happy. Please on on the uh, other phone. Have good a good job, Shabbos, everybody. Good job, Thank you. Thank you.